All right, and sharing my screen, and here we go. All right, so, and let's make it big enough that I can read it. Okay, Jim, so you had a proposed topic. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I've been experimenting with Podman myself um, at work and stuff, and one of the things I was going to suggest is maybe uh, pushing the images also to Quay.io uh, to have people be able to pull them down in that uh, kind of repository. I know we briefly talked about that when there was the whole um, rate limits and uh, questions around uh, Docker Hub and stuff like that. Okay, a good, good topic. And great that we've got Olivier here. He and I had a recent conversation about use, possibly using multiple, multiple container registries. So that's, yep. that's the idea. The question is concept and use of multiple registries, strengths and weaknesses, right? So strengths mm -hmm. and, and weaknesses. Because I assume that Podman can use an image from Docker from the Docker Hub as well, yeah. can't they? Okay. Yep, it's already <laughs> registered by default. Uh, when you go down to pull down an image, you actually can choose whether it's searching the Docker IO or Quay IO. So. I see. Okay. So, so what? I'm I'm not sure if you want to talk that now or uh, yeah, let's maybe let's get the let's go through the agenda okay. first, and then yeah. we'll prioritize the agenda, and then we'll we'll I suspect we will get to it. Let's just be sure we've got everything on the agenda. So, Jim, were there any other agenda topics that you wanted to be sure we covered? No, the, the suggested topics were wonderful. Okay, so Damien, any t any key topics from you that are uh, that are not already on the list here? I guess one for me was this one: testing and validation is sort of a hot spot for. I think you're doing great, making great progress there, but would love to have a conversation about that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I don't see any uh, other topic right there. Okay. Um, Olivier, any topics that you'd like to add to this, add beyond this current list? No. Okay. All right. In terms of ordering, I, I would like to be sure we stay absolutely within two hours and I'm willing to consider even less than that, but let's put the highest priority things first. So for me, this one, Docker image support for multiple platforms is quite high priority because I'm interested in ARM64 and Jim's interested in S390. Um, I think testing and validation are both high value because of their relationship to image, to delivering the images at all. So I'd propose we put those two pretty high on the list. Any objections? Okay, great. All right, so I'm going to move them to the top of the heap. Um, this maintainers topic, I would like to be sure we get to it. I'm less concerned. Uh, personally, I would be interested to, to to briefly talk about publishing images because I mean I think it can be we can quickly talk about that. Um, okay. I don't think it's a big big change, but uh, I just want to. I mean, we are clear there. Okay, so publishing Docker images. Good topic, and Olivier, we would have you take the lead on, on more details for it, okay? Good. Anything else? Yep, let's go. Okay, great. So, um, first topic, Docker image support for multiple platforms. I think the crucial thing here is we need, we need, um, we, or we have equipment to do the builds, right? Because so we, we have, have the, so we have the equipment for CI the Jenkins that I oh, But oh, CI okay. the Jenkins that is not configured to push um, to the I would say production um, organization. The reason to that is because CI the Jenkins that is a public instance, and we don't want to take the risk to be. I mean to have zero day whatever so we use a different instance named trustless ci uh, which is only available from a private location um so basically uh for the harm 64 um 
it's pretty simple because we just have to copy paste the configuration to have them on Amazon, which is fine. Uh, regarding the S390, um, I'm not sure if we just reuse the same cluster, which I think is fine uh, because in the end, uh, we are only using that Docker from there. Um, and, but yeah. Well, and the trust, same. No, no, I sorry, sorry. Trust, trusted at CI. Yeah, trusted at CI. Yeah, that's oh, is it trusted that does the image builds today? No. Thank you. Okay. I mean, maybe maybe we could move that to infrared at CI uh, because Damien did some work there to to build images uh, and to test images. So I mean, you, you work on the shared library that build Docker images, test Docker images, and so on. So, and it's an infrared at CI. Sorry, configure. To use that, but the specificity of infrared CI right now is it's running on Kubernetes, uh, so which means that we would have to put more configuration to provision instances. I mean, again, it's not a big deal. It's just like we have to to clarify, to clarify what we want. Um, that's it. You, and I I know that the S three ninety that we're running has a more than sufficient capacity to be added as an agent. It would be a static agent, um, just like it is with ci.jenkins.io. Um, I assume that's OK, right, Olivier? Is there any issue connecting a static agent to the Kubernetes cluster? No. OK, so, so, so there so, the challenge so, so is ju 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 just, just more to... than anything. Just to clarify, um, the Jenkins running on the Kubernetes cluster is the same Jenkins and, and everything else. The specificity is we have access to the to the Kubernetes cluster, so we can schedule pod, which is faster than provisioning of, of Windows machine. So that's why we would want to. We would basically we prefer to build images on. on using Kubernetes, using pods, but obviously it does not work for a different architecture because Kubernetes does not provide nodes for those architecture. So it's just easier to provide the configuration. Yeah. Um, S, uh, the S390X is having official support for Kubernetes since 1.20. I don't okay. know for IRM uh, and PPC. IRM 64, it should work, but I'm not completely convinced. The question is more, uh, is it possible to add custom static nodes to the existing Azure managed cluster? Mm. The, the proposal here, and if you want, I can start the topic here uh, with an issue, but the idea will be to have a Kubernetes cluster, but a specific, with, for specific architecture, maybe a second one. So from Jenkins point of view, it's just um, Kubernetes and pods templates. That's the only resource we have to manage. And on the infrastructure side, we should be able to provide Kubernetes static nodes to uh, directly. So, okay. So now you're educating me on something I wasn't aware was even possible. So conceptually, we could have a Kubernetes cluster that has multiple architectures available yes. somehow in the cluster. Yes. So, so the the S three hundred and ninety and PowerPC and ARM could con conceivably deliver, um, what do you call them? Not is it nodes to the to the cluster or could deliver yep. capability to the cluster for that architecture? Wow. Okay. So, 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 oh, so on that on that topic, um, I have three concerns. First, we have to double check that AKS to support that because yep. AKS is a specific managed cluster that we have that we are using in Azure. Um, so that's that's the first limitation. And if AKS supports it, now we also have to be sure that the version that we are using support it. Um, mm -hmm. So to me, it sounds easier to just configure Jenkins with the right SSH key and to SSH. I mean, to to to, to start the, the the Jenkins agent directly on the the, the cluster, on the sorry on the agent instead of trying to configure the Kubernetes cluster to have the nodes, especially considering that we won't be using a lot of agents on those architecture. Right. Okay, I would, um, so the idea of um, having a Kubernetes cluster, maybe it, it's not the AKS, it will be cool because it would avoid uh, spreading the maintenance of the Kubernetes control plane, but then the hypothesis of at one moment on time, we can reach an AKS or AKS cluster and that we can add these specific nodes. 
the idea is that that cluster could be reused across our different instances. Let's say we could have a namespace for infra and a namespace for trusted, for instance. And the idea is that both Jenkins should be able to reach the cluster and build on their own namespace and reusing the specificity of the architecture by using uh, annotation and toleration on the pod template of each. But we would have only one Kubernetes setup and um, which each Jenkins instance could connect to. Mm. That, that was the initial idea, but if we have to deploy our own control plane, then it doesn't make sense and it's not a good idea. And in that case, the yeah. static. But that was the idea, depending on how we want to share that setup and reuse it. So just, I haven't, just, yeah, sorry, go. I was gonna say, I haven't used AKS, but uh, internal to IBM, uh, we I've been testing multi-arch clusters on Kubernetes for a long time. Um, that's, that's kind of what I do uh, for the majority of my day job. Um, so I, I can tell you it, it works well. Um, again, I don't know about AKS. The only thing that you need to be careful of is if you have generic like um, definitions, right? Uh, when you go to do your deployments, uh, you need to make sure that image, whatever you, you guys are using is multi-arch uh, or that your registry is aware uh, and knows to pull down certain arch specific um, containers. Uh, that, that's where a lot of people run into trouble. Um, yeah. So. The, the, the idea here would have been um, uh, to to configure the, the nodes to add, I don't remember exactly the name, but there is a setting that you can apply yeah. to a node in Kubernetes so, so, to say, so basic, yeah. don't schedule That's... unless you are explicitly asking that specific label. What, what, Jim, what Jim is suggesting, it's a really good suggestion. Um, but yeah, as Damien is, uh, is mentioning, for instance, right now we have pods that only works on Windows. So we have specific uh, pod annotation. Yep. And that just explicitly says. Um, and then we need so. to ensure the images uh, are built for this architecture. But at least for S390 and IRM, we that sure that we can have these images. And both can be generated from Intel architecture with cross compiling with KMU. Uh, this is a feature you have on Docker for Mac, for instance, but it's easy to run on Linux. For the PPC architecture, I, I have no knowledge on that. So I totally rely on, on yours there. Um, <clears throat> I know, I know in Kubernetes, there's also, I, I know you mentioned labels for windows and stuff. There's also a, I think, I think it's still in beta, uh, but there's like an arch selector you can utilize too. Uh, I can look up the specific, um, mm -hmm. uh, tag or whatever it, you, you want to call it. Um, uh, as for what, what was the software you, you guys are looking for Scopio or was it Scopio? Is that what you're talking about for no? For I think PC? I think what Damien was asking was just if if this same Kubernetes facility that you've described as known to be working with S390 is oh. it also available with PowerPC? Uh, yeah, as far as I know, I we we have clusters with uh, S390, x86, and uh, and Power. Um, okay. So uh, cool. yeah. But yeah, again, I, again, I, I just yeah. Morning. Oh. That's it. Sounds easier to just configure Jenkins to SSH on the agent, on the PowerPC uh, agent. It, and... I would say in any case, static SSH or Kubernetes, we need to do what uh, Jim just said. We need to check for the base image existence for each architecture. This will be a requirement because the goal here is to build Docker image on these machines. So we need to be sure, yeah. and it it should it looks like that Docker is supported on the free architectures a standalone Docker engine, but we still need base image to get started from. And and do you no, know, we don't already have GNLP agent for other architecture than IMD64, right? Uh, well, that's a good question. I we, thought we, we did. We have, we, let's, go ahead. we have for Windows and for, for IMD64. Mm -hmm. Okay. The so... official open GDK image provide for power for IBM Z and IRM64. So we should be able to to start building and bootstrapping the GNLP. So maybe we should start, as you said, Olivier, to avoid the bootstrapping issue, like starting with static nodes for initiating the first version of the image. That... And, and, once, and once we get limitation, um, we yeah. investigate um, configuring directly Kubernetes yep. for that. And I would add something is that the setup of adding non-Kubernetes agent on InfraCI is something we need because Currently, 
we build Docker image using IMG because we don't want to run nested containerization. Even with Docker rootless, there are still some hiccups in security concern. And we are testing only the tar of the images using a specific tool. If we want to, to execute Docker run commands somewhere, whatever the architecture, we need static agent. We should mm. consider that for security concern, it's not possible on infra CI now with Kubernetes. So it could be totally worth it to start learning and applying setups to have static agent or agents that are not Kubernetes in infra. So, so specifically for that, um, we already have the configuration on CI to Jenkins.io. So we just have to export that to Gcask and then put that configuration. So we already have the configuration. We have the secrets in place and, and so on. So um, and that could once be you know where, yeah, yep. yeah. once, so, once yes, you know where to look at it, it's pretty fast. OK. So, so let's start with these machines and then the base image for the architecture and then we can go ahead. OK, so I, I think what I've heard then is we're OK with initially going with static SSH build agents mm -hmm. um, for PPC and for S390X with the equipment we've got access to already and the dynamically launched cloud agents that we're already using on ci.jenkins.io conceptually should be available as well from, from infra or from trusted so long as we configure them. Did I understand correctly? Or did yes, you... exactly, exactly. Yes, so okay. in the case so... of trusted CI, we just have to copy paste the configuration. I mean, uh, using the web user interface. For infra, we have to put that in the GCAS config file. Um, obviously, I would prefer to have that in the GCAS on infra. Um, so because, because we have to work on trusted CI and CI to, 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 to put the configuration in a file anyway. So. Um, if we already do that for an infra CI, that we simplify future work. Great. Okay. So I think I caught the notes correctly then. All right. So, so it feels to me like we, I can, I've, I've heard a description of a path forward to give us S390, ARM64, and PPC support short term with static build agents and with the option in the future to become more flexible and use. Kubernetes, if we wish. Did I yeah, did yes. I say it correctly? Yeah, yes, exactly. Just exactly. something I want to be sure on the note. I see you you have written need to connect something as a static agent to trusted, isn't it? To infra. No, I think it's. I thought Olivier had mentioned that today Docker images are built on trusted. Yes. Uh, okay. We may we may change that in the future, but today they're built on trusted. Okay. So then, can you change the infra on the parent bullet? because we are say publish from infra.ci. Yeah, oh, oh, yes, you're right. Thank you. That's completely wrong. No problem. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Thanks. for the, the comment, uh, Jim. Yeah, it's a node selector and we can select the architecture. It's built in in Kubernetes. Yeah, Great. no problem. Awesome. I, think, I think it's <clears throat> in some versions, depending on what version of Kubernetes you're running, I think it's out of beta. So you should be able just to mm. cut off the beta and just do the Kubernetes IO arch. That is correct. Yeah. In, in, the, in this case, it's a managed cluster, so we have to check that they enable that feature. <laughs> yeah. And also, and also something that I noticed in the past, and since I'm using AKS, each time is often when a new feature is available, you need to reprovision the cluster from scratch. Um, so sometimes, depending on what you're looking for, uh, we may have to replace something. Which is, I mean, everything is automated, so it's always a good time to to test that we can reprovision everything from scratch. But yeah. It's not as simple as just um, yeah. a little trial by fire. <laughs> right, See if right. it works. That, that's the story. Trial by fire. And just soon I just soon not have any more fires than absolutely necessary. Yeah. So if you want to do that, yeah, I don't want to be around. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So nothing else. I think we've covered Docker image support then. Um, okay with that one. Ready to talk to the next topic? Um, just just the last last for the that Docker. What I would do is I would first try to configure infra, and once we have the right configuration and we are sure that it work on infra.ci, we configure trusted.ci to use that. Ah, uh, okay. So, so so we use inf so we use infra as a testing environment to validate that the change will be uh, working. I see. Okay. Um, the reason to that is 
first because trusted that CI is quite critical. I mean, it's a critical instance. And also we have to work on having the GCASC configuration anyway. So um, I think that would be a good way to, yeah. Okay, so that means the static agent to S390X, static agent. And now for my, for my clarity, I assume that to, or at least today, what we've got running on the S390 on PowerPC is we run a different user account for ci.jenkins.io than for my little toy test that I use to test Jenkins separately. And I would assume we would use yet another account, a different and independent account so that it's not the same account that's being used by ci.jenkins.io because we, we don't want those agents sharing sharing their user account. Is that is that a, a, a reasonable assumption, safe assumption? Yes and no, because we will be dealing with Docker commands, which mean oh. even if you have different user on the host machine, they will share the same. Right, document. right, okay, which which may mean it's not relevant. I hadn't thought of that. Of course, these have to be able to run Docker. And it's still better to run, at least for clarity, because you will have, at least on the file system, a clear separation between the workspaces of each agent, the ports, uh, the processes, they will be separated. It's still a good practice, but we have to to assume that multi uh, multi tenancy is not uh, won't be easy to get there. Right, right. But so it's it. One of the crucial things is Docker command line access is required, and as an example, the the agents that I run cannot run Docker on those machines. And it was it was intentional. I, I don't think ci.jenkins.io agents either have that. So these these are distinct in that sense that they need to be able to execute Docker commands. Jim, Jim, would it be possible to have one additional yeah. machine? I had exactly the. Uh, yeah, because... for S three ninety, that it's not a big deal. Uh, we we can get you a, another cluster. Uh, for PPC, uh, it's probably the same thing. Uh, if you guys want to go through the headache of putting KVM on top of either one, you can. Uh, but I think getting another cluster would probably be easier for you guys. Yeah, because what what I fear in this case is if if we want to, I mean, the way I always consider CI to Jenkins that I as not trusted, um, just because it's publicly accessible, because whatever may happen, I mean, right. Um, so I would not feel comfortable to run Docker um, daemon on from trusted CI and from CI to Jenkins that I yeah. basically. No, that yeah. makes sense. And plus, yeah. you don't want someone hopping on, doing tests, and then screwing up uh, the environment yeah. and stuff. So, so, so from I mean, I'm I'm fine to use infrared CI and trusted CI because infrared CI is only available from the VPN. So, I mean, the risk is lower. But CI, the drink is that you. I mean, we we really take care of updating it all the time and so on. I mean, we we are. Um, Taking on that service, but I mean, you never know what what can happen on those building yeah. services. Yeah. Just if in, I, in... Yep. Oh, yep. great. Um, I, I would add also that Infra CI is now completely working with GitHub app setup, which means that a contributor can see the repository of the code of the source code of whatever Docker image we want to build and share. They will have a feedback from the build, even if they cannot access the infra CI. And in particular, the GitHub app with Jenkins setup provide the build outputs and anything which is um, which could fail on the Jenkins build, you have the output on the GitHub check, which means these GitHub are available for any public contributor without requiring access to infra CI. So we can completely have a setup, um, a welcoming setup for contributor keeping the specific static agent on infra or trusted behind the VPN, not publicly available. Um, so it's not mandatory to have these machines on CI.jenkins.io. We can totally set up the build on infra and trusted, on infra for the build and test, and on trusted or whatever, wherever you want for the publication. That It's a kind of intermediate because these are specific machines and we cannot apply large scale uh, security setup like we can with Kubernetes. So in that case, we could, let's say, compensate with this. Okay, so so it seems like we've got we've got an action item there that we will for, to, to address Olivier's concern, we do need to ask for a separate, a separate 
thing, right? A separate machine or a separate cluster, whatever it is, a separate thing so that the untrusted environment, I think that makes sense, the untrusted environment that is ci.jenkins.io and the trusted environment that is infra or trusted.ci.jenkins.io do not risk contaminating each other through their Docker, their Docker command. Now, ci.jenkins.io is not currently allowed to execute Docker commands on these on on S390 or on PowerPC, Olivier. So so the permission isn't there. Uh, so okay. but but I think it's still a valid point to say if we in the future decided to enable Docker for ci.jenkins.io on these machines, we would now be risking contamination between infra or trusted and the untrusted CI server. And so so now let's put the question the other way. Um, do we really need to have CI.jenkins.io with those architecture? Well, if we don't, for me, it 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 sacrifices some of the tests that I've been running on those architectures mm -hmm. to confirm that certain plugins that claim to support them actually continue to work. So so but but the reality is we could say, oh, let's drop those from ci.jenkins.io, just move them to trusted and to infra uh, because, all right, that the one plugin that I'm testing there uh, is actually not that critical. It's just, it was just an exploratory test of a platform plugin. And okay. I will say Kubernetes will be a nice solution here. Meaning that if you need to run a container on this specific architecture in the future with all the image built on infra after a few months, then as soon as we are able to add Kubernetes clusters to CI Jenkins IO, it's easy to ask for a requirement. I want to run that image on a restricted environment for that architecture. But so this is long-term future. Yeah. It's different. Okay. That's, that's first. Yeah, that's first. So, so I think Olivier, back to your earlier, we could take S390X and PowerPC off of CI.jenkins.io. I don't know of anything critical to the project that depends on them being there. They were added as an experiment. We could easily remove them and move them instead to infra and to trusted. Then, then, then they are fully under our control, you know, without the, the risks of execution from an untrusted CI server. Yeah. An untrusted sounds so dangerous, but, but really a publicly accessible CI server. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but everything that is publicly accessible is untrusted. Right, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the, that's the, we're, we're, we, we want to be safe. Good. Anything else on this first topic then, Docker image support for multiple platforms? Oops. Uh, yeah. no, just I'll, one I'll, note, mm -hmm. the IRM64 uh, uh, can be used as a, with EC2 instance, I don't know for Azure, but there are EC2 uh, templates. For which, are, which architecture you mean? I, IRM64. Yes. Ah, we already got, so CI we have those. Can, right. already configured. Okay, so yeah, for this fact, one, it will be hazy. Yeah, we in, already in fact, in... we use those, my, my platform labeler plugin, as valuable and important and critical as it is, the platform labeler plugin already tests with ARM64, and we know that CI.Jenkins.io starts and stops those instances very, very well. And we, we already have Packer images for those. Oh, right, yes, yep. So we just we just have to so this is something that I noticed we have to to update the EC2 plugin to a later version because in newer version you can always reuse the latest uh, MI available. Um, it's something that I discovered quite recently. Yeah. Um, and... Go ahead, Jim. Uh, there's two other topics I, I want to mention right here. I know I think one of them is actually going to be covered later on. Um, <clears throat> my first question was for ARM, are we, have we decided if we're specifically just targeting ARM 64 or ARM like V8, I think it is, uh, you know, like the kind of new ish ARM, not AK, not ARM 32. Um, are, are we just supporting that or are we supporting, you know, the other versions of ARM as well? So the, the only ones that are interesting to me are, are ones that identify themselves specifically as AARCH64 in Linux. Okay, yeah. So that's, and, and given that today on Windows, we officially declared we only do, we only deliver a 64-bit installer. 
Today on okay. Linux, we are very blunt about, hey, you need to use 64-bit. So, so I don't, I, I actually know it works on 32-bit ARM because I happen to have Raspberry Pis in my basement, but we're, but that's, that's irrelevant to the whole, to the, for the project, 64-bit is, is all we need. Okay. Did, you, did you see something different than that? Are you aware of crucial use cases that we may have missed? No, no. I mean, I, I just know like older pies, but I mean, even older pies are getting phased out with uh, the right. newer pies. I think it's 3B plus uh, switches over to the ARM 64 uh, architecture. Uh, so yeah, 3B plus and up will be supported. But I think if people have like the earlier threes and the lower ones, uh, there's only 32 bit. Uh, but yeah. I think just kind of directing people to 64 is fine. Okay. Uh, the only other thing is I, th I think we are, I think you have it down there maintenance, but are we decided on what images we are going to support with multi-arch? I know there was brought up multiple times in the SIG meetings, uh, the platform SIG meeting uh, that we you know, of course are doing the Jenkins main image, but I know there was talks of agents and, uh, the other kind of uh, helper. It looks like you have them right down there. Okay. Well, and I think I think those are crucial questions that we need to reach in this session. And okay, having sure. Olivier and Damien here together with you is especially valuable because it helps us talk through process and identify how we think we should proceed. All right. Awesome. Okay. So testing and validation on multiple platforms, I think at least the topics that were of concern for me, we've already covered in the earlier, in the earlier discussion. Uh, so long as they're available in some place that consuming plugins or Jenkins core could decide to run tests, it, that, that seems good enough to me. Any, anything else that people are worried about? Um, Damien, you've, you've led some specific efforts here on testing and validation. Is there anything here we should be considering or talking about additional development efforts? No, um, right now the, the binaries we are using for building and testing on constrained environment and to avoid using Docker are Intel only, but written in Go so they could be cross compiled. So that means that right now we will need a full Docker engine for these specific architectures for building and testing. So uh, in that case, it means that we need all the safety feature we we, sp we spoke about earlier. Uh, isolated machine separated from the infra trusted, et cetera. Okay, so this, when you, when you say tool, Golang-based tooling, this is things like Jenkins version and, or is it? Uh, so I'm thinking uh, particularly about IMG, the, uh -huh. um, a binary compliant with build kits and a Google container structure tool, which is a command line that parse a YAML and run a set of checks on a Docker image, uh, either using only the tar driver, so it only checks the content of the image and the metadata, if you don't have Docker or don't want to use it for security. And eventually it connects to Docker to run a bunch of tests for behavior driven development. So these are two tools that can be completely compiled and cross compiled because this architecture are officially supported by Golang. So there should be no issue on that or one bug or the other, but um, it's the only thing is that we need to start with Docker. Right. And then we'll go ahead securing and securing. Right now, this is mandatory and we need to take measure according to, to this. Great, all right. Jim, anything you're aware of on that topic beyond what we've noted already? Uh, one question I did have, uh, is there any vulnerability scanning that we are doing with the, the images? Um, so this, this, yeah, this brings to another oh, topic, okay. I didn't which see was at the end. So. <laughs> My bad. Uh, yeah, well, that's can, excellent. That's that. the way you just keep asking those mm -hmm. questions. That's brilliant. <laughs> no scanning yet. Uh, yes, we need it. No, um, so I, the, I should so, say it differently. No official scanning, right? Because there are so, a number of yeah. us who have, have running prototypes of scanning and have seen the output and, and want to improve. So maybe you want to, to briefly talk about that now. So as, as Mark said, multiple people uh, from time to time use uh, scanning tools. 
to identify vulnerabilities. Um, several, maybe one week or two weeks ago, we've been discussing about adding that to the process um, mm -hmm. when we build images. My, my, not fear, but what I feel is if you put such a tools in place, but nobody look at the outputs and um, try to really solve uh, what we see, um, then it's useless. Um, and each time I run such a tools, you cannot really automate the results because you have vulnerabilities that are not really vulnerabilities. And so for each output, you need to really carefully read um, the output to really say, okay, this one is dangerous, this one is not really dangerous. Um, and that's, until now, um, I really don't know how to, to deal with that. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, also, it's, uh, yeah, sorry. No, it's, I was gonna say, it's not something I've done personally. Uh, I've, I've seen a couple of repositories, uh, you know, open source communities uh, start implementing it. Uh, I don't even think Adopt OpenJK has implemented it yet. They might have their own internal stuff, but not any of the uh, more popular tools. Um, is there not like a, um, again, I, I'm not, I've really played around with it, but like, obviously it will slow down. I, I know uh, Mark right, this, uh, it will slow down the build process, but is there not a way to build it into the CI, CD, like publishing uh, kind of pipeline where like, you know, you go along, build them all and then test them and then, if there is an error or if there are concerns, open like a PR or open an issue on the repository and somehow automatically like dump uh, the log outputs or link the log outputs and tag a couple of the key members um, to address it. And if not, you know, if nothing, you know, continue on and publish the images publicly. Is that like a workflow that you've seen or would be acceptable for you guys? So I've definitely used Sneak to do scanning of images that that I'm trying to be a maintainer of, mm -hmm. and and I can scan after the fact. Uh, I think I think it's a valid thing to consider Olivier's observation that having a scanning run that we then ignore doesn't help, and so it may be part of the maintainer role is if you agree to maintain, you agree to read security things and you agree to think about them and resolve them in, in the system. It just, for me, that it's, it's not, not come to full fruit yet. I know that the, the outputs that I've found were in many cases did not say that we had a serious problem to me. They said, oh yes, they found this issue in this particular corner, but I'm also not a security professional in terms of deciding, mm. is that a real threat to this image or not? And so, in, and here you have two things that you have to scan. You have to scan when you build a new image, but you also have to scan that your old, let's say, LTS image are not affected by your vulnerability. Um, such features are usually provided on a, a registry, um, but that kind of feature does not come for free. Um, so for instance, I think Docker Hub provide that, um, but it's not part of the open source program. Um, yeah, I thought that Linux Foundation Security also had a, uh, that LFX had something. We've got the benefit that Andrew Grimberg is online uh, from Linux Foundation. I don't know if he's act actively listening at the moment, but I thought there was a security here, service. In a car. Oh, oh, so, okay. so I thought there was a, a webinar recently. I missed it, unfortunately, Andrew, on LFX security services. Um, is image scanning part of that? Do you know? Um, I believe so, but I will say this. It's actually um, essentially enterprise. I'm sorry, um, say, say that again, Andrew. It's potentially. They're, they're currently using SNCC under the covers. Right. Um, but I think it's a paid for edition of SNCC. Oh, OK, good. Cool. Okay. I do know that they're also looking at a few other technologies for that, but right now I know think is what they're using. And that's okay. what we're using in so yeah. Good. Very good. Thanks, Andrew. Sorry to drag you out while you're in the vehicle. That's great. Thank you. I know that's fine. That's, I'm on. I'm on mute mostly because I'm in mute. <laughs> All right. 
so so either way, you got you guys are actively looking for a solution um, to to do this. We just need to figure out what workflow and what resources we can utilize uh, yeah. that would actually work for you guys. Would it? Have you guys thought about like blocking? You know, obviously like scanning after you publish the images is definitely an option. Uh, but have you thought about like just blocking the publishing if there is an issue found? I, I would, I was unwilling because blocking, at least for me, blocking based on some new non-analyzed vulnerability reported by an automated tool is more than likely to leave us continually blocked. When I looked yeah. at the, at the, the output from Sneak for the images I was testing, there were always comments there. And many of them, there would be a place where they say, issue, no known, no known remediation. So they found something in a library that was in the image, but there was no known, not even from the operating system vendor, there was not even there a known remediation. And, and if there's no remediation, I think in that case, I'm really hesitant to block our image publishing be, for something that may not be relevant and may not be even accessible in the use of the image in our context. Yeah, and, and the real challenge, that's why, that's why I said uh, you usually need someone to, to look at the output because sometimes, let's say, you have a package with a known vulnerability, but it will only affect you if you use in a specific way, which we don't. It's just like a dependency of a tool that we, that we need to use. Mm -hmm. And so blocking by, default, um, blocking by default a job would just be a waste of time. Um, but on the other side, if you just say run security tools, um, but don't fail if you find something wrong, then you will not look at the output. So that's right now, that's that's the challenge that I have. It's, it's like, um, it's really like having a lot of unit tests that fails and some are not relevant to your projects. And you have each time I have to look at is it relevant or not? And so, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's what I fear by automating that. Um, so yeah, each time- I, I, each I time have a different run, advice on that part because it's like the linting. Do you, do yeah, you really want to make linting blocking or not? And that's exactly the same kind of concern. Um, mm -hmm. What I don't know for the security scanning is, the, are we able with tools like Sneak or Trivi to put first a threshold or ignore certain rules because that's what mm. you will do on Lint if you want to ensure that Lint is applied, but you know that for a specific rule, you can ignore it. Most of the time, the pattern is in line or in a file. You explicitly disable that rule in particular for a specific context. So that's why online inline command. And you had a comment explaining why. For instance, okay, we know that the package blah, blah is subject to that uh, whatever. We don't have any case where with that image, so we disable that particular rule for that particular package. But I don't know if the security scanning tools provide such feature for ignoring, so I don't know. But so if they, does. we should totally add the blocking CI and add ignore rules because it will complete our knowledge and it will provide a, something it's, that, that is like test. If unit tests are failing, you should not skip the test. It means there is something to be done, either removing the test or fixing it. Um, but I don't know. The second point here is, I don't know if we can do a diff between the, the rules and the issue that come from the parent image that we cannot do anything about and do a diff on the instruction that we run. When we build the official Jenkins image, we inherit from the from OpenGDK, whatever. If we do a diff, we can see what our image is adding in terms of security issues. And then these issues are valuable because they point us to something that we install. Either it can be package that we install that we don't need in the end, so that could be an indicator, or this will be real life. And the goal will be to remove a lot of the noise. We only focus. So maybe if it's possible, because again, I don't know if technically we can do it. I don't know the form of the reports of the tools. But having a diff between the from image that we use and the instruction we run, then we can extract a list of security issue, which is um, less prone to creating noise or to be exploited, and it will be more important. Interesting. But again, yeah. we have to try. Uh, we have to try it because my knowledge is next to zero on this. On this, on real, I rely on Olivier for 
on you, uh, Mark, or any of you, of you folks. Yeah, I, I, I haven't, I haven't, I think that's ingenious. I've just never tried it. I think that's a very good idea because what you just described is, hey, the packages we added in our Debian, Debian packaging, for instance, when we add Git, when we add, um, let's see, pick another one, GNU PG, GPG, and we add them because the because Jenkins runs better with them installed. Uh, but that means we've now accepted them as an additional security liability over the adopt open JDK image that is our base image. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good idea. So it looks like we can ignore some issues on SNCC. I'm not sure right. uh, the level details, but that could be a good one. Well, on trivia, on trivia, you can you can ignore you can. some level as well. Yeah, I I'm sure, right? So yeah, you can. So the proposal things. here will be uh, the same as when you had linting to a project. That starting with a non-blocking, of course, because we don't want to be blocked on our current capability to deliver. Right. And we do a threshold, like for the free next month, we run the security and we see what we can do with it. In three months, if no one, absolutely no one, either from the infra team or the community did anything, then we can stop using it because it, it means that what Olivier uh, described is true. If no one has the time to check and to read and to act, then it does not make sense. But it could be at least a side report, and then we can decide after a few months after trying, because maybe it will create new opportunity, new tests that we don't see right now. It's worth trying in, uh, with the goal in mind that at the moment in time, it should be blocking, but it should not at the beginning. But we still think about what if it's blocking. Yeah, good, good. good. I think that's, those are valid questions. Very good. Anything else on securing and scanning the Docker images? No, but yeah, it's definitely a topic that interests me. And I wanted to work on that since years and just don't have the time. Right, oh, hang on, get that. Okay. All right, so uh, next topic then, publishing Docker images. I guess I guess we want to merge uh, this next point as well, so. Publishing oh, oh, to, yes. So my, my point was to publish to Quay.io. Um, I'm not sure to understand. So this is something that I've been thinking when I was looking for Docker Hub um, solution. I mean, when they stop providing the, the free tier. Um, but now that we have something in place, I'm really wondering why we would have to, to publish to Quay.io as well. Because it supports multi-architecture. Um, it supports Podman as well. So. I'm really curious about to hear about uh, from Jim. Um, yeah, so I, I'm just starting to dive into the whole Podman experience. Uh, Jenkins, uh, I don't know if you drop, uh, if you know, but, sorry, not Jenkins. Uh, Doc, I don't know if you know, drop support uh, for um, S390 and Power uh, going forwards. Uh, they still have like, I think the last version publicly accessible via their servers. I think there's a couple of like custom builds, uh, but you know, what's the validity of those, you know? Uh, but I think it's at like 1809. So, you know, any of the new Docker features going on 19.0, uh, which I think includes build X, a couple other like beta features and stuff like that, aren't gonna work on S390. On PPC, it doesn't really matter too much if they're just remote um, agents. Uh, if you're just using it to like do builds and stuff like that, it doesn't really change the functionality. But if you did Docker Compose and stuff like that, but internally, my team is looking and evaluating at switching over to Podman. Um, and as I've done that, I'm starting to uh, understand the ecosystem and, and stuff like that. And hence, Quay.io is one of the the new kind of parts to that ecosystem being another uh, Docker repository. Um, and I think right now there isn't too many differences with Quayo and Docker. I mean, even when you go to do a, a pull of an image, uh, Podman has a little like a uh, command line uh, option to either search docker.io, uh, which is the Docker hub uh, registry or Quayo. Um, and you can pick which either one to search. Um, 
but I think it would be nice to give users an option uh, to pull down from Quayo. And I think uh, there's a couple of cool features um, being added and additional things being added to Podman and Buildaw, uh, which I don't know if you guys looked at Buildaw, but it's like the, the build engine to Podman. Um, and I think those features are probably going to be working with Quay.io or um, loosely coupled with Quay.io. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to look into exploring and pushing images there uh, and getting a presence on Quay.io. Um, I haven't really found out. Uh, one, of the, one of the issues I haven't really looked into is uh, you have the official images from Docker Hub, right? Uh, that whole official image repo and stuff like that. Um, I haven't yes, really but seen. We, we don't we we don't use that for Jenkins. Yeah. The official yeah. Docker image. Yeah, I, I know. Um, and I haven't really seen if there was a equivalent or a kind of comparison on Quay.io. Uh, so it might be good to establish some sort of presence on Quay.io. Uh, you, you know, marking down. Hey, here's the official Jenkins images before. Uh, someone else might come along and do stuff uh, that might confuse users and stuff. So, so that, that was really my my point. So I can I can so that's a good point. I can I could definitely uh, register the name on Quera.io. My 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 fear here is if it does not really add major values to how to maintain both registries. I mean, on our side, it slowed down the process. Um, from a configuration point of view, it does not change because we can just add one additional tag. I mean, we just provide one additional credentials and we just one additional tags, and that's fine. But ultimately, we'll have to, to push artifacts in a new location. So it will slow down security releases, LTS releases, and, and mm. so on. Also, once you when we start public pushing image on query.io, the community will expect us to keep maintaining them. So if we I mean if for some reason we, we don't want to, to use those images anymore, then we'll have to write a blog post to communicate about that. So um, that's why we that's why we created the Jenkins for Eval organization on Docker Hub. So we could have we could experiment and we could have, uh, yeah, we could experiment with images. But in this case, I just fear that um, we are just putting too much constraint without getting values from that. Um, so if, if tomorrow it appears that we need to use Quedad.io for having more architecture, um, maybe that would be a good reason to switch to Quedad.io. Mm. But for now, I think as long as the community is happy with uh, images from Docker Hub, we, we have the process in place to push there. So yeah, no, I, I think I think that's perfectly acceptable. I just want to throw it out there. But I think, um, like you mentioned, I'd go register your account or the Jenkins account over there, uh, at least have some sort of presence or username. So when if you if you do down the line need to push there or want to push there, uh, there won't be any hassle, I guess. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, that makes sense. So in terms of, Jim, you mentioned Podman as a crucial part of your ongoing exploration mm. for image building is, and, and Damien had mentioned IMG, um, my simple mind had only been thinking about the Docker way of doing these builds. Do we, as a as a container and platforms track, need to think about any changes specific to those, or is it is it sufficient to say, okay, we we will build with an image builder? It could be Podman with Builda, it could be uh, IMG, it could be Docker, but people will use the containers in any case, or is that simplicity not actually there? No, I, I think I think if you guys are supporting the Open uh, Container Initiative OCI, uh, you guys are fine. Uh, Docker okay. has both support for OCI and Podman does too. Um, so with, with the OCI, that, that's the whole purpose of being able to be uh, transportable uh, across any um, kind of containerized uh, platform. 
Um, so, and, and as far as I know, the images you guys are building are OCI client. So uh, there shouldn't be any issues. Yep. Great. It's compatible. All right, yeah. thank you. Thanks for that clarity. Okay, so now publishing Docker images for me had one additional, which one was, and I guess it's a separate topic it's the speed at which we build our images or the, the, the delay between the arrival of, a, a, let's take the security team as the very specific case. A security issue is, is detected, resolved, but now they need to announce it and then publish the image. And I've, I've heard noise from the security team that, hey, they'd like our image publishing to be faster. Is that already covered in pending pull requests? We just need to take them through the full review process or do we need more focus on accelerating our build process? We need more focus, particular because we don't parallelize a lot of things here. And also a lot of the testing process is a mix of uh, black and white box testing. It's a bunch of bats command line that will test the behavior of the image while most of the time um, the issue can be cooked with a, let's say, static test, because most of the issue we have seen are a missing file or a file that change inside the, the, the file structure inside the image, a metadata that will be missing. And so that's the work we started on Infra CI and that Cara has worked on on the GNLP agents, uh, mysterious uh, images. Uh, the idea here will be combining parallelization of the build, enabling build kits, and maybe delaying the behavior, the, the big bunch, the big test harness, which run a bunch of images because this need power and time. While most of the time we could say, do we trust enough the test harness, at least the first part of the test harness to be run efficiently, quickly. And if it's okay, then we can publish and run a test harness daily in the CI principle. But the slower test harness will be more a uh, to ensure that we reach some quality gates. But for security, they might not have the time. So in order to be sure that this would optimize, right now we need to start measuring the build time. We need to check the trends, maybe put them on Datadog if it's not the case, and start acting on a building to be sure that we identify is the build, the build time taking time? Is it the tests? Is it the publication? Is it the three of them? But we need measurements. So Whatever we'll do to uh, optimize this, we need to validate each time. If we don't have measurement, we are blind and it doesn't make sense to say it's going fast if we cannot prove it for at least ourselves. So we need to put some focus on this as the next steps as well, just to be sure that security uh, issues can be accelerated. Got it. Okay, thank you. So, so there is work to be done there, great. Yep. Um, one question I had about that is uh, about accelerating the Docker build process. Uh, and I don't really know much about how you guys' machines work. And I know we talked about static agents uh, for SU90 and Power. Uh, but I know one of the big things in Docker build is caching of the different layers. Uh, and I think for the majority of at least the Docker, or the Jenkins main image that I've been working on, right, it's, it's pretty much the same for the beginning layers. Uh, and then later on, when you copy the binary or uh, do a couple of downloads, those might change. But if we have some sort of caching mechanism that's saved uh, in between the builds or some sort of way to do that, that should speed up things a lot. Uh, but I know there are some issues with caching if it's done improperly um, in so, terms of, you know, game messy and stuff. So the, the main limitation that we have right now is the scripts which builds the image does that in sequence, it build one image, then the second one, and, and so on. So the, the good thing is the same script is run on the same uh, virtual machine, but it's definitely not optimized. Uh, and we just, I mean, it's typically the kind of example where someone work on something and we just organically put new features to the that, that, that script without really taking the time to refactor it. So that's what we have to do today. Yeah, I, I, I do have a PR open from the multi-arch builds. Uh, yeah. And you're right, where the Jenkins, like part of the build trip is looping over building the last, like I think 30, builds of Jenkins uh, to kind of keep those ones fresh and do OS refreshes and stuff like that. And those do cache very well 
Um, because after you build the first, you know, half of all the Docker containers, it's really not much changing. Um, but I guess I I, I, I don't know. It, it's I, I guess it's really that that first build that will probably take longer, uh, and then each one after that uh, should be all cash and stuff. But uh, it would it would take a good amount of redesigning to kind of really optimize it. But I don't know if that's where things are taking the time, uh, or you know, I, I think yeah. we. We just mentioned reporting, building, and tracking, and seeing where actually the slowdown is. Um, yeah, the, the the issue with caching is that we might have issues. Uh, how do we ensure that uh, um, that a given release? Because here we are the release. So most of the time, we like to build the release from scratch to be sure that any package index inside the image are freshly downloaded, etc. Mm -hmm. And the caching and validation depends a lot on Docker, at least on the, the content of the instruction run inside the Docker file. So if we don't change the instruction, we might lose with caching the update of packages internally. That's yeah, always the, the, the issue. However, that, yeah, um, right now, I don't know if we are using build kit, but uh, there is absolutely no caching issue and we could have some caching at least on the base images. Um, and also, Right now, we have different Docker files for each images. While if we were able to run a Docker build on a powerful machine with a single Docker file that contains a lot of multi-stage, if we enable build kit, it's far more efficient than trying to distribute the build on multiple machines. Because build kit is really impressive in its capacity to parallelize, to pull different layers at the same time, because this does not have any issue and it's completely able to create a graph, complete graph of dependencies and build in parallel as much in the graph. And I've had a lot of improved time on most of my setups with this and on big setups that are far bigger than this one. So that could be also an opportunity, a mix of caching and um, using build kit. Mm -hmm. But again, as you said, we need to measure and we need to be sure that this is the part which slowed on the builds. Uh, with with the new Docker pull limits uh, implemented, uh, mm -hmm. is your guys' account for when we actually go to do uh, like the, the builds and publishing, are you guys using like a premium account to get around that? So like if we had to pull down Alpine, we have to pull down, uh, you know, Debian Buster, Debian Slim and stuff like that. We're not going to hit those limits because uh, I've been hitting limits with my free account. But I, I didn't know. So we are not because uh, we are sponsored. Uh, I mean, we are part of the awesome. open source plan from for Docker, basically. Okay. I, I was going to suggest if, if we are hitting those limits uh, or also just to speed things up, uh, the caching of those images uh, somewhere. Uh, like, okay, let's cache, you know, Debian Buster. But again, with caching, you know, you, you, you might miss... I, I don't know. I haven't really found a good Docker cache uh, for myself anyways, so I don't know what's out there. Um, That's yeah. correct. Right now, in terms of measurement, I've had the link on the conversation, which is the GitHub Actions feedback from Jenkins for the official Jenkins controller image. We, it's nice because we have detail of all the timings, but the first thing here is that the build part is implied. I see a build. But since the build is done before each specific operating system, right now we are not even able to differentiate how much time did it take to build a slim image and how much time did it take to test it. Mm. Because there is a build step which seems generic, we took nine minutes, and then we have 15 minutes per test. So we need to be sure that the tests are not implying a rebuild each time. And since we're using a make file, you see where we might have different issues there. So that's some, let's say that should be a first topic. Be sure that we have a clear separation between build, test, and deployment. Okay. Uh, maybe this is something we can contribute from Infra CI because right now we have a big library um, with a lot of parallel builds. And I think that using declarative pipeline here and benefiting from Blue Ocean visualization, we could have details uh, metrics. So there is some work on to do on this. Nice. Okay. I think Victor already started some work. There is, a, I'm sure, there is a pull request for that. Okay. Uh, anything? Any other 
discussion needed on the topic accelerating our Docker build process. Feels like, Damien, what you described is we need to measure and yep. we've got preliminary measures already visible in through the GitHub GitHub actions the ch or the GitHub checks. Mm -hmm. And then, then we start looking at what things we could do to accelerate. You mentioned BuildKit. Now BuildKit is not something that I'm familiar with. So that's a, that's a higher level thing over Docker? No, uh, it's a, a feature inside Docker, which oh. is only enabled by default since the uh, last December release of Docker, which we don't have yet on the machines. So depending on the version of Docker we are running, we might have to set an environment variable to the value one. I think it's build kit underscore enable. It's a quite easy one. And immediately your Docker engine will start using build kit. Um, if we are doing caching- Are you sure, are, are you sure that we don't have, why, why don't we have it yet? Because uh, we reinstall Docker all the time. I mean, in the, ah, no, 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 no. I, I know why, um, I know why. But so the yeah, reason we need why, to, yep. The reason why it's not there yet is because we have a process to automatically update uh, Packer images that we use in on Amazon. But the problem is the EC2 plugin for, requires you to, to manually update the MI. So we are running an old version. So we need to bump the, um, the EC2 plugin. Don't worry, then... it's a two time process. First, yeah. the, easy, the shorter path should be setting the environment variable to the value one inside the Jenkins file or better on the make file that takes care of building the image. Once we do that, we can immediately measure the gain in time. We might or might not, I don't know, but it, this will be for, for later. Uh, most of the time where build kit is better out of the box is in evaluating if a layer needs to be rebuilt or not. It's really efficient. We speak about 10 times faster. Uh, so then we will be able to implement an efficient caching because the caching is different between the standard Docker and the build kit Docker. We have to consider build kit to be the new official and default way to build Docker image. It's just a re-implementation of the Docker build engine. IMG, Builda, I know Builda has a, um, a specific mode to produce OCI image using build kits. There are build kits that can build on remote Kubernetes. There are a lot of work around this, but it's an internal feature and it's a re-implementation far more efficient. Do, I do worry. I, I haven't actually played around with BigKit. And uh, I, I did see build kit in when I was exploring Builda, uh, but I do worry about S390 and power um, being, you know, you mentioned the last December build. It might've been in a couple of the beta oh. builds, but, um, it might not be available on S390 or power. Um, so. Good to know. Right. Thank you. I, I, I can test that later today and at least poke around. Cause I mean, if it, if it, it does all you say, then it, it would be useful internally for myself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any, any other topics on accelerating the build process? Okay, next topic then. This one's a little more painful. Maintainers for existing Docker images. So just before we continue, I just want to mention for Quad.io, so I reserved the Jenkins CI organization name, but the Jenkins one is already taken. Ah, okay, so. But this is the kind of thing that we can ask uh, to the platform. Uh, we can open a support ticket and sometime it works. I mean, I already retrieved Jenkins name on other systems previously. Great, yeah, okay. All right, so maintainers for existing Docker images. So the, the, the statement, the problem statement here is that we've got Docker images that are in various stages of being cared for or not being cared for. And the proposed Jenkins enhance, the idea for the Jenkins enhancement proposal is that we, we use the GitHub uh, code owners facility to assign maintainers to declare maintainers for specific Docker images. And if there's no maintainer, 
then we use the adopt a plugin, adopt this plugin process. Or images so that people would understand as an example, I'm not paying significant attention to the CentOS images. I pay a lot of attention to the Debian images and I pay a little bit of attention to the Alpine images, but we need somebody else who's interested in CentOS to take on CentOS. Uh, and so those th that's the concept here. Um, then the notion is we need that for controllers that's the one I pay a lot of attention to, agents where I don't pay nearly enough attention. Uh, and then infrastructure images, because these are, those are also crucial to us. And we use dedicated infrastructure images for specific tasks, if I understand correctly. Damien and Olivier, can you help illuminate for me a little more there? Yes. So um, le letting aside the renaming of the agent, that went from GNLP to inbound agent. For SSH agents, I don't know if it has been renamed, but I will expect outbound agents. But that means we have a dependency graph for all the agents related image. We now have a base image that only specify the, the minimum for an agent, which means a Jenkins user, an open GDK, and that download a sample of the agent.jar even though there is also an entry point script, which role is to start an agent. So you pass it the parameters to connect to your master and it will download the latest agent. And that's all. Then from this, we have inherited images on other repositories for inbound and outbound, which mean installing some specific script for the GNLP inbound connection, supporting WebSocket or GNLP, and in the case of SSH, adding the logic of installing OpenSSH server, setting it up, and adding a script able to collect public keys from the environment at startup. So we have the common image, inbound and bound images. These three images are mandatory to be maintained by the community as well as the controller. Because we use these images for Kubernetes default plugins, for Docker agents, for a lot of setups. Then um, we, you, there is a bunch of images inherited from the older GNLP agent. They are actually on Jenkins CI slash GNLP dash agents plural form uh, repository. And these images are published to the Docker Hub. And it's a library of images that provide a kind of base ready to go inbound agent with specific tools for a specific language. For instance, GNLP agent Maven GDK8, GNLP agent Ruby, GNLP agent Python 2, Python 3. They are for Windows also, like Core Runtime. There is a bunch of images. So the first issue of these images, and this is something that we I propose to add uh, next to the code owner and maintainer adopt this plugin, is that these images on the Docker Hub doesn't have any description. They don't have a readme because by default Docker Hub catch the readme from the images. And the publication process of such image, if we keep them, we must have a readme with at least a badge that say, we need a maintainer or the maintainer and the source code are there. Because right now this image in, these images look really suspicious. As a Docker Hub browser, I see that image with no readme, no information about the repository where the Docker file come from. I mean, it could be a Bitcoin miner for what I know. So the idea for whatever, all the images, because the controller has, but for the other, we have to check. We need to be sure that we have a readme and the correct way to evaluate the trust a user can put. It's not perfect, of course. Even readme does not guarantee that the content of image has not been dealt with by a malicious user. But still, in terms of image, documentation, user experience is mandatory. Going back think... to that, yep, sorry. Uh, I was gonna say also, I think um, I know a lot on like a couple of Docker hub uh, instances and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, when people post images, they have the readme that usually links back to the GitHub um, for more information. But then if you guys can include like a link uh, or something like that in the GitHub or on the Docker hub page, 
to yeah. where it, the images get built. Like if it, if it is a public build line or, or what, uh, that would help clarify and like that trust, yeah. right? Like you can see, hey, this is coming from Jenkins. Here's the build and here's the publish. Um, that, that exactly. would look really yeah. good. But, but for that, we can only provide uh, a link to the instance that we use to test the build process because mm -hmm. in the end, uh, we build and publish from a private location. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, but, but yeah, I mean, that, that, that makes sense. That, may, yeah, that makes sense. That would be useful to have links to see other things anyway. Um, and I also don't, re uh, I don't remember the name, but there are a few services that provide embedded badge that you can put on Markdown, which are SaaS service that run the equivalent of a Docker inspect. And so they provide you a web view of that uh, given image on the Docker Hub with the analysis of each layer. The Docker Hub also provides such service, but adding this can, at least the minimum, the link to the Docker file, as you said, eventually to the test process and the contribution process is a minimum. And also if it's in adopt a plugin process, there should be a badge or something really visible like yellow warning, big and visible that say, hey, this image is waiting for a maintainer. So if you use it, contact us to help us maintaining it or risk having this image deprecated in the future. Um, that could be a place to also have security uh, concern if there are like 100% uh, of security, whatever trends. And also the, the point here, um, so we, we have the readme, which is a part of the process to, for all images. But the issue we have with the GNLP agents images is that we have people using these images, but not only we have a dimension of maintenance around the operating systems, like the Jenkins controller can be built for different GDK, different operating system, different CPU architectures, same for the GNLP. We have a new dimension of, is it an inbound or outbound agent? Is it expected to use SSH to, to be connected to and started, or is it expected to be GNLP WebSockets? And now with these images, we have the concept of a fifth, at least, dimension. Do you want Maven 3, Maven 4, Python 2, Python 3, Python 2.7, Python 3. whatever? I mean, that's a lot to maintain. It's an exponential effort. While the goal of using Docker images or even better, uh, Kubernetes pods, it's to have minimalistic and isolated images. So there is that whole topic of do we need these images? And if we need, there is no problem. When I say we, it's as a community. Do we have community user who rely on these images? Are they willing to maintain it? Because maintaining, testing, checking security for of all these images has a cost. And we can be sure that we need controller and agent images, but do we really do we really need these images? I, th I think that's that's the question. Uh, do we really need to maintain every images? I mean, that's the same for the default Jenkins image. We maintain an image for Debian. We maintain an image for CentOS and for Alpine. Um, in the end, what I mean, what the benefits of doing that um, from a Jenkins point of view? I mean, we don't have. I mean, it's, I don't think that's that's the responsibility of the Jenkins project to maintain every image for every combination uh, of scenarios. And so I think having a code owners would already simplify because something that I find challenging is we have many different images. We have many people opening PRs, but following and reviewing PRs take time. And once the PR is merged, then people assume that we will maintain those images forever. Um, and I mean, it does not work this way. And so, for instance, we already saw well, last time we had to build the Docker images for the for, for the stable release. It took us like one hours. And again, do we have to build image for everything? Does it really make sense? So, I, 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 I would I would definitely be interested to have code owners for specific images. But more importantly, I would also like to have a procedure where we could remove images. Because, for instance, when you go to Docker Hub, you'll see, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, for instance, for Blue Ocean, for instance, I think. Uh, there are Blue Ocean Docker image 
where the latest tag point to a very old version. And so I know that I already had people in the past saying, oh, look, I tried that Docker image and it was not working. And so it was just a not used image. So I think we should have a more aggressively um, process to delete images that we don't want to distribute anymore. So uh, I know that I, I, I don't have a solution. I, I have certainly seen that even the, the Jenkins images, we were our Debian 10 or Debian 9 controller image was based for a full year on an image that the Open JDK project had stopped maintaining, right? So we were based on a tag that they had just stopped maintaining. And so we were, we were locked backwards in time for that year old JDK version. Uh, but I don't think there is a way to remove an image once it's published. It's it's published, right? It's yes, you can cached all over the world, and so so you you cannot you cannot remove the image from uh, the end user on his machine, but at least you can remove the tag. You cannot remove the image, but you can remove the tag. So yeah. by removing the tag, the, if the person if that person is using the digest, he will still be able to retrieve the image. So if that person is looking for a specific image, let's say the latest pollution image, then that person won't be able to download that image. Well, but but for me, that feels, uh, at least uh, that seems too aggressive to me because I, I leave to their judgment if they want to continue using something that we're no longer actively, actively updating. Um, a Docker which, image is a snapshot in time, isn't it? Which they can with the digest. So when we depreciate or, or delete because of security issue, for instance, we can add a message that say, okay, if you used what, uh, an image on that list and you want to keep using it despite the security or depreciation alerts, change the, the tag name by this di digest. So the tag won't be, um, it, it will remove the, the searchability of the image on the uh, Docker Hub but they will only have to switch the digest and they will keep using that image with no problem. It's only the tag discoverability that change in that case. Yeah, it just, it, that, feels, that feels different than how I'm used to thinking of, of code we've delivered in other places where we don't, we don't actively prevent you from running an outdated Jenkins version, even though we know it contains security vulnerabilities. Leaving the tags there seems harmless to me in that they're they're not we're not gaining much by deleting a tag, are we? No, for, what I'm personally Correct. the one that I fear is the latest tag usually. Oh, okay. Yeah. So okay. but because for me the latest tag is confusing when we know that we don't update an image anymore. Um, I see. So that, I mean, I mean, I don't really care if we have uh, images mentioning a specific version. I just want to be sure that we don't. We don't have latest image that are not latest anymore because we don't use them anymore. I would say having things written. If the main readme of the official image mm -hmm. has a section saying these images are known to face security issues, or it points to a file that lists all the, ta the known tags, then it, it's, it's already good enough. Saying okay, these images are, are considered deprecated and won't have any maintenance, and these images are known to embed security feature, we recommend you to use that other whatever. So you don't remove tag, but you have you share the knowledge to the community that they should not. Then it's as you say, their choice to keep using it or not. Mark, didn't we? Uh, I think didn't you put a proposal together for uh, the what platforms or what OSs we support and deprecation and, and stuff like that. I, I think that would be a good kind of bring up yeah, and, and at least, yep. you know, look at or uh, absolutely. And, and, and that's, that's, that's the, the, the general theme here is that that specific idea, that concept. So I, I, you're, you're absolutely right, Jim. I think this is the right place for that. And, and the ideas that have been added here um, adopt this image and code owners and including it for agents, not just for controllers, um, feels like a really healthy thing to do. So mm -hmm. for me, it feels like this should be one of those things. Yes, we, we feel we need this and it's an adopt, adopt, adopt this image process and a process that people know that this image is up for adoption so that they, 
they they are intentionally caused to think carefully before they choose to use that image. Yeah, no, I, mean, I think I think having like a document that really spells out, um, you know, what the deprecation path is, uh, you know, especially like if we're you know upgrading from Debian versions, you know, Buster to uh, Stretch and, and stuff like that, you know, how that process works and what tags. I, I know I think with uh, Alex. We, we talked about um, the new tagging scheme, at least for mm -hmm. the, 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 the um, main image. Um, right. And the windows is starting to car, the windows images are starting to use that. Um, talk about like, okay, hey, the Jenkins, you know, colon Debian tag, right? What does that point to, you know? Cause that, that changes in, in given time, right? Whether that's, okay, the, the latest Debian, right? Okay, that points to stretch, and then we eventually need to move it to the next uh, LTS. Um, so detailing how that works and what is the current one and stuff like that would be extremely helpful uh, for the community. Yep. And a good, good place to add those deprecations. You know, like hey, hey, this is deprecated. Here's the security concern. Uh, please use this alternative image uh, if you want to stay on Debian or something like that. Right. And uh, also, I want, uh, I want to add while we talk about the tag, uh, the example that I have here is if you pull the Jenkins CI slash Jenkins Docker image, you're running the version 2.151. And so, so it's a very old version. And so if someone is not necessarily aware that that image is not maintained anymore, um, that person will just try to, to test Jenkins using the latest tag and it's not the latest version it's a very old image i have a proposal for this <laughs> like building just one more time a latest image which on three point start with a slip 100 seconds with a message that say this image is unmaintained unsecure you should check another tag just to be sure that we keep the latest it keep exist but if it takes two minutes to start then you will be really compelled to use an, another correct version <laughs> yeah i mean so most, most people have to check the the logs anyways to grab the whole uh, api key or password i forget what it is um so it'd be cool to add that deprecation notice somehow into those images. I don't know how you would go about doing it, but I, I like your idea of, okay, hey, if we deprecate a image, right, let's rebuild it one last time and add the deprecation notice into that message somehow. I think that would be really, really cool. And also a good way to communicate to users that, hey, you <laughs> you should probably move to something else. Okay, well, so, um... We've actually already got a, I think it's a, a, an interesting idea. We've got a facility already that will alert users of security vulnerabilities, right? We've got an, a, the admin monitor that appears and says, you're running a vulnerable version. And, and that's already there. And we've got admin monitors that show that you're running outdated plugins with versions. So maybe we ought to consider a way of saying, hey, this Docker image is also somehow outmoded and add an admin monitor for that. I mean, it's okay. It's not, it's not quite as, as straightforward, I think, as Damien's proposal of, gee, let's just put a 60 second sleep in with a big output to standard out. But I suspect it would be more likely to be seen. It may, it may be as likely to be ignored as any of the other things we say. Yep. In that case, it, it won't be alert fatigue if we have different media to, to communicate on this. Okay, good. Uh, any, any other conversation we need to have on that particular topic? Um, I have two, two points here. A first one that is an idea from Garrett, because I think, I'm not sure if Garrett is there. He is. But we had a discussion about discoverability on the contents. And since we mentioned having detailed tagging syntax, Another complementary tool that we have on the Docker images are the labels. There are two kinds of label schemes that are metadata associated to the Docker images that you can tune and that are defined by OCI or another scheme. And so we don't, I don't see any label stuff 
on the official Docker images, but adding these labels to help discoverability by implementing at least the standard OCI scheme and maybe adding information like the Jenkins version, the data, so date and time and git commit are also metadata. Of course, this metadata can be tampered with. However, it helps for discoverability when you check the information about an image without running it. So we could also use this as a support to complement the detailed tagging syntax by saying base operating system, by saying the package list or the tools list if it's installed and adding a bunch of metadata to explain the intention on a different way. That'd be awesome. Do you have a link to the OCI or the labeling standard? Uh, that, that'd be really awesome. I, I honestly haven't really played around with labels, but that sounds really cool. I know Scopio, uh, I think that's the name, is the, the one of the tools that pod, well, one of the tools you can use to, you know, uh, interact with remote images without pulling them down. Mm -hmm. So I imagine you can look at labels uh, and decide whether, hey, this the image I actually do want uh, based on those. So that'd be really cool. And maybe we could add the, if there's like a dot label, like, hey, like this image is looking to be adopted or, you know, it's being maintained by community member X. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of cool. Um Garrett, are, are the the link on your on the tool you've wrote to to check the diff between labels? Yes, they are. Uh, uh, I'll send. I'll put the individual links in. But oh, there's cool. yeah, there's the open container spec, and there is the label label schema. They're the two different ones. Thanks, and I'm taking the opportunity to also share to everyone the tool that Garrett has written. It's a common line that we start using on the infra that uh, did, does a diff between two images in terms of labels, which is really useful when you rely on the labels to understand what is the content of these images. That's awesome. So these are... I know. So maybe you can share the link, maybe share a link to that tool as well. A label scheme, okay, sweet. I know um, one of the things we do, or one of the improvements I, I did in the build scripts, and it's in my PR, was uh, doing, grabbing like certain info down from Docker Hub's API, like instead of enabling some beta features on um, the command line. Uh, and it, one of them was like using the remote inspect and stuff like that to gain more information. Cause I don't want to have to pull down. One, one of the things I was doing in the build script was avoiding pulling down images if I didn't need to, uh, to kind of speed things up. Uh, which we do have some of that in the build scripts already, but I was trying to be more, more aggressive, uh, whether checking we actually need to build something again or uh, stuff like that. So the labels could be something really useful um, if we start implementing them in the images. Yes, yeah, so this uses the registry API to, it queries them directly from there without having to pull down the image. Awesome, that's, that's so, super so cool. It's, pre it's pretty quick. Um, there's a few helpers in there as well. If you want to like add, if you're doing a Docker build locally and you want to add all of the labels or the build arcs, however you want to configure it, um, it's quite handy. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's cool. And it'll, the latest thing I did was adding the ability to diff two namespaces. You just you, you basically just provide the names of the namespaces. It tells you what images are in both and um, if there's any difference between them. It's quite quite handy for debugging things. And if, you, other, if you're using Kubernetes. <laughs> and the other point I wanted to make, it's about the amount of images we have to maintain. So that, that's a topic I, I want to bring to the GSOC. The idea is that right now, when we build images, all these images, in fact, it's like we build a set of meals that are already pre-baked. And something, if we deprecate some of these images that are not strictly mandatory, something we could provide to the community will be the recipe to build their own image because we don't have these things. And a lot of the images on the Docker Hub have a documentation section on the readme that say, okay, if you want to extend that image to tune it, here is how you should do. And there, there is an example, a Docker file sample that say from whatever image, run, apt-get, install, blah, 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 packages. And I feel like that all the GNLP agents, instead of maintaining image in the future, if we don't have code maintainers, um, 
one of the solution on the deprecation path could be providing a Dockerfile generator or at least some documentation that say, okay, if you want to install some tools on your inbound agent, here is how to do it. An example with Maven from Gen uh, Jenkins CI slash inbound agent, run uh, apk aid uh, maven or on debian run uh, apt get install maven or curl whatever version of maven check the sha and this will be the idea of a docker file generator where you would have a form that will be hey i want a jenkins agent inbound or outbound operating system should be windows debian whatever and i i want maven terraform whatever select and then it's only textual it's a library of textual run instruction block that could generate the textual file. This can be done in JavaScript on a static website that could be done on numerous way. So this is long-term, but at least short-term having a first documentation that say, hey, how do you, how can you extend that image? Because this is an information a lot of user and on using these shadow images, but in fact, what is their real need, what they need? They want to customize their agents and run it with Docker container or pods. So if we show them how to do that, they will take care of building, security scanning, testing, maintaining these images on their own because this is these are their specific needs. While here we provide still a added value with the base image and how to extend it as a, a complete documentation. Because it's not only about providing labels or image built, it's also about providing the value or maybe teaching people how to build their own image. This is completely um, a proposal for uh, at least documenting and best case building something that could be useful. You're muted, Mark. Yeah, it looks like you are muted. <laughs> Damien, so the I, I like the I like the concept. It feels like it supports the idea of hey, if we have no maintainer, we mark the thing as as up for adoption. Up for adoption means it's not actively being maintained, right? And and then if we have even better ways to hint, here's how you can overcome the up for adoption by adopting it yourself for your specific needs. Here are the steps you do. I like that. Good. Okay. So by basically it's reducing the number of images we are maintaining by teaching um, users to build their own images, to maintain their own. Great. Yep. Share recipe instead of cooked meals. Right. That's Any, stated. Anything else on, on that topic before we go to what appears to be our concluding topic, we've got not more than 20 minutes. I've promised myself I will stop at two hours. So official helm chart for Jenkins was one. And then I'd like a few minutes at the end to just give you all a description of what I think I'm going to say tomorrow in summarizing this track. So anything, any topics you'd like to address on official helm chart, we put it on the list as a possible. I'm not sure what you would like to discuss there or describe or, or so who, who, who brought that topic to the, to the this was just me putting putting topics as a possible so it's not something where i have passion to say oh i have or even ideas because right now right now um we have two kind of ham charts in the in the project we have the official jenkins ham charts this one is using github pages uh so we just put so just yeah just a github page where we, we publish uh, i think they have a process in place um jared contributed to that quite recently um i mean I think it's it works. So I don't think what something that we could bring here, we may sign the chart, but I'm not sure the added value to do that. Um, on the other side, we also have ham chart on the Jenkins Infra projects. Um, so those are not versioned. Um, it's not a big deal for us at the moment. 
um, but yeah, we may. I I I got access to Hamchat um, to a Hamchat repository on the GFrog service on repo.jenkinsia.org. Um, so we could push our Hamchat there. So we would have everything under repo.jenkinsia.org. But I mean, for the official Jenkins Hamchat, again. There is, I mean, they are already using that. The community is using that, so I would not change the, the endpoint anyway. Um, so I don't think we have much to to to, to mention here. Uh, what, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, one, one thing I, I I noticed with like Kubernetes and stuff, um, Helm charts are still very popular. But I know there's been an uptick in operators. And having a Jenkins operator might be uh, kind of cool. Uh, you know, operators more managing the life cycle over time. Well, my understanding of Helm charts is more just like a single install, uh, which I think you could update it, but uh, operators kind of handle that magic for you. Yeah, but there is already a Jenkins operator. Um, oh. that, that thing was pushed by Virtuous Lab and Red Hat. Um, so you have you have a discussion on the dev mailing list about that. Basically, they propose to collaborate to develop um, the, the Jenkins operator. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, but that'd be cool. I know the operator I'm probably imagining is only for x86 pulling those images, but it would be kind of cool to see uh, as we make progress on the other um, you know, points in multi-arch support. Uh, looking to update the operator to enable multi-arch support too would be kind of cool. So I put I put the link to the project in the chat. Okay, sweet, thank you. So something that came up on the Cloud Native track about an hour ago um, that we sort of discussed is when you're using this Helm chart and you're applying updates, uh, quite often there is a period of time at which Jenkins is not available for, and you're likely to miss webhook events um, coming from something like GitHub. So uh, there was some talk about whether we could create something external to Jenkins, but included optionally inside the Jenkins Helm chart that basically does some kind of store and forward of webhook events to Jenkins internally. Um, that's something, that's, something that's fast to restart, um, low memory, light, yeah, nice and lightweight, and done, really. Um, I also have a, uh, let's say, um, nice to have, but not mandatory. It's that um, I've used the Helm chart three times since the past year. And each time I ended up having to, to search for the correct value because the values have, were changed. And there is a shift that, but it's a classical for all Helm chart of the world that sometimes the values that default, the, the default values YAML file, which is the source of truth for default values and the documentation associated to it, tend to shift. And for the traffic official M chart, there, there is, I, I don't know if they're still using it, but two years ago, what we started was improving the CI process that was linting the whole Helm chart by adding a, a dumb shell script, but I'm sure we can find or build something that check that if a given value is defined on a default value file, then the same value should exist on the associated readme.markdown. Just to be sure that the CI should fail if you change a default value without updating the documentation. Because even the best person in the world, if that person is exhausted and changed something, forgetting documentation happen all the time and it's not a human issue. So since all human can do that, that error, having a tool that helps us to that improve the user experience because I've, I've been pretty frustrated but I know deep dive how Elm chart works. Someone who is new to that environment will just retain the experience that Elm and Jenkins are painful, so let's use something else. So it's not mandatory, but that's, that could be really a, a something easy to, 
uh, not that uh, complicated. It's not easy, but it's not complicated to implement uh, that could add some value for the newcomers there. Um, I'm definitely I'm definitely in favor of such initiative because they are relying on a, on a outdated documentation. It's really frustrating. Yeah. Anything not, anything that fails the build and it's not been done is yeah. good. <laughs> definitely. And I have Excellent. one last topic that has been brought to me yesterday by someone who dropped on the room. And that's something I already had this discussion also during the first dem event. They ask if we can use customize with a K, uh, which is an alternative to Elm to install. So right now I naively point them to the fact that Elm can export the result of the chart as pure YAML. So you can have a Helm whatever command that output a bunch of YAML that can then be piped to customize. But I don't know if we, so it's the same debate. Should we provide for every package manager? I don't know, but maybe mentioning the trick of the Helm to YAML pipe to customize could provide an easy entry solution at least. Yeah. Uh, I don't know all the pro and cons of using customize, but this is, this is built in in the kubectl binary out of the box since a few versions. Ah. And, it's pretty and it's pretty popular anyway, so it would be nice to just give some hints and anyway. Yeah. yeah. Again, it's nice to have. It's not mandatory, it's not blocking, it's not something to prioritize, but anyone willing to contribute on that part, minimum it will be documentation and maybe a few commands or one test on the CI. And like the previous issue, those are too easy to get started for new contributor, for instance and being a good learning opportunity as well. And I assume, Damien, that the way that would evolve would be by pull requests to the, to the documentation that supports the Helm chart, today's Jenkins controller Helm chart? Uh, yes, and complementary pull requests to the Jenkins with Kubernetes documentation on the official doc. I think oh, that's oh, the right. one that Zineb created. That could be, I don't know the status if she's still working on that, if there are other contributor, but that could be something to add, uh, pull request on both documentation. Yep, okay. By the way, I'm just wondering um, the best way to highlight the Jenkins um, the Jenkins community operator in the Jenkins ham charts. Maybe we should put that on the download page. I don't know if it's already there. It, it's it's definitely not. So you're you're envisioning it would be someplace like here, bringing up this page, on this page somehow. Um, yeah, why not in download Jenkins with a link to uh, Jenkins of Kubernetes operator and Jenkins ham chat. Hmm. Documentation. Yeah, I mean, we, we certainly have Docker and we have some rather exotic ones like uh, OpenBSD and FreeBSD and Gentoo that are actually outside the outside the project. So we could easily add Helm charts because, here. Yeah. Helm chart and Jenkins of Kubernetes operator, and it would be in the head test because by default, I think we are using the later, the stable version. Yeah, yeah, that I, I think that's that's a very good idea. Yeah, thank you. Let me make a note of that because no reason we can't add the Helm chart to the downloads page. Page. And, and that actually is maintained, that's maintained, if you will, by the project. That's not like this FreeBSD package yep. or the OpenBSD. It's really maintained by people who are part of the Jenkins project. Good, okay, I like that. Yeah, and, and today I think the Docker link just takes us to Docker Hub. Yeah, so we could have a link that go, does something similar, takes us to, navigates to the Helm chart. Good. So I think it's charts the Jenkins that are you. Okay. Yes. 
So just chart the Jenkins value, the endpoint. Ah, okay. And, and there isn't a, a centralized repository any longer of, of Helm charts. No, no. Great. Okay. Nice. Any other topics we should be discussing here? You've, you've been heroic at almost two hours of working on this track. I think we cover a lot in, this, in those two hours. So in tomorrow's closing session, I, I intend to present uh, a summary from this. I've got, let's say 10 to 15 minutes, actually no, more like five to seven minutes. And in that, what I was going to thinking to do is let me, I want to put yellow highlights on the things that are, I think should be mentioned, right? So I'd like to mention this one that we intend to do. Oh, silly. We intend to do, okay, there's, oh no, I don't want text color. I want the background color. How do we do a highlighting Google Docs? Okay, sorry, you're watching me learn how to use Google Docs. That's really awkward and embarrassing. Uh, this is the one that I would like to include this. Okay, so, so then I, I didn't think we needed separate mention of this. It's for me sort of part of Docker image support for multiple platforms. We believe we need more work on securing and scanning. So that I think should be mentioned. And accelerate now, do we, I, I don't know that we're ready to mention publishing Docker images. Olivia, are you okay if we hold on that one? And should I, or should I say that we're planning, we're going to be discussing it further? Uh, I think we need to discuss further, yeah. Okay. This one though, accelerating the Docker build process, I think it's safe to say, yes, we feel like we need to, we need to work on this one. And then the, the concept of the platform support Jenkins enhancement proposal, I'd like to talk to. And I think that's, okay, so, so I was, is there anything from the Helm chart topic that I should include in tomorrow's summary? No, maybe that, that we have a Jenkins controller. Um, and, and so Jenkins um, Kubernetes operator and the uh, M chart, but the, yeah, that's all. Okay, so mention that the Helm chart and operator exist. Great, okay. And for me, this reducing the number of images is sort of a natural natural outcome of our going through the Jenkins enhancement proposal, the JET process for adopt and, and code owners. We will, we will naturally be highlighting that. Okay. Anything else that I've, that I should be mentioning tomorrow as voice for this track that, that I've, I've missed. No, it sounds, sounds great. All right, and you are welcome to, to chime in tomorrow and correct me or update. We're, we're again going to do it as a Docker meeting, not as a webinar, um, so that, or Docker meeting, as a Zoom meeting, not as a webinar, so that you will all be able to make yourselves voice. Uh, and, and intentionally, it's a, this is part of a contributor summit, not just a presentation to, to have the world. So join us tomorrow for that and looking forward to it. Awesome. See you tomorrow. Thanks. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.